Um, so, the, so maybe the, the material I was asked for to deliver tracks a bit foundational for So it's, a, it's perhaps a bit foundational for uh, the next to last day, but we'll see as we go. I mean, in case it's too... Well, I'll tell you what I prepared and how we're going to go through it. It'd be just uh, a blackboard talk. Well, lecture. Z. And so my... So the original program was to go through the basics... Standard, the, the standard basic formalism of continuous variables, and then introduce Gaussian states, and then show something about their entanglement, because it's mostly because these are, these are quite old results, like 15, 20 years ago, um, old. But they're very, uh, the seminal in the sense that such techniques are, are, are quite far reaching, even in, in, in uh, in nowadays research, and you can still apply them, so they they kind of be they could they could be beneficial. Alternately, in case we are a bit faster than I thought, or you don't want me to go through all the details and such, because that's what I was about to do. Uh, we might so the, there might be an end of, of a final lecture on. Uh, uh, quantum estimation on, on, on how to calculate the Fisher information of, uh, well, in, 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 again in Gaussian systems because that's the formalism that I'll, be, I'll build up in the first couple of lectures. But maybe, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes and then uh, maybe you'll pitch in and tell me whether, uh, what you prefer. So, okay, but by continuous variables here we mean mostly in a, in a winter college, though there's no winter anymore, but I mean in a college on quantum optics. Uh, well, we obviously, you know, continuous variable just means systems. So a continuous variables, this blackboard is so big, man. I'm going to feel it. It's amazing. Wow. So I'll start from here then. Uh, okay, well, continuous variables that that you know, because uh, uh, quantum, eh? of course, it's quantum optics, so it's a formalism, so it's the systems that underlie quantum optics in the sense of the electromagnetic degrees of freedom in second quantization or any standard quantum mechanics 101 system that behaves like that. Uh, let me just uh, remind, remind myself of what notation I want to use. So that's, uh, of course, something that you are all familiar with. There's a big identity operator there, but you know we call it a C number, like to take on some attitude. Um, right. So these I'm going to write, and, and in particular, there'll be I can put these labels because I'm going to talk about a finite set of this. So a discrete set of uh, canonical variables, uh, pairs, yeah? And that's the difference between, somehow it's the difference between quantum optics and quantum field theory. Although in quantum optics too, you some, sometimes you get to deal with continua of modes that maybe interact. So, you know, when you, when you describe leakage from a cavity or from an atom, whatever. So these are the degrees of freedom, and that's what they're called. They're called continuous variables because as opposed to discrete variables where you have like, you know, quantized levels, stable quantized levels in an atom, you would have uh, operators with continuous spectra. Yeah, that's very trivial. Something that is slightly less, well, it's still trivial, but like the way I'm going to organize my formalism is, that fol is the following way, which is slightly less standard. I'm going to order all of these um, operators in a vector of operators R, and then uh, And then uh, I'm going to rewrite the CCR, the canonical commutation relation. This is how mathematicians call them. Even though typically mathematicians will tend to, mathematical physicists will tend to express them as exponentials because they have problems with the domain of these operators. But we don't care at this stage, but well, certainly not. So the CCR, I'm going to express them this way as... Uh, 
Uh, okay, so what I mean here is that I'm going to take the outer product of these two vectors. That's why I write a vector and a, and a, and a row vector, a column vector and a row vector. So you take all possible pairs of, of commutators between these operators, and you'll end up with a matrix. Obviously, technically, this is an operator-valued matrix. But there's always the identity, so we don't care. We have to just to bear this in mind. Eh? And this matrix there, ah, right, I can't raise this. <laughs> I can't lift it. So is, it's, uh, it's this thing. It's, uh, let's say we have n degrees of freedom. This is uh, uh, a direct sum of these blocks. It's an anti-symmetric, non-degenerate matrix that, that's written that way. So this embodies, uh, this sort of um, represents the, com the canonical commutation relations in this formalism. I like this formalism because it's very powerful and will allow us to prove things rather quickly later on. Well, formalism, this notation more than formalism. So these are continuous variables. It's a bunch of, of, and why are they relevant? Well, you know, by the end of this three, two, three weeks, for some of you, you should be familiar with this, but, and I think you are, but just let me repeat. There are many degrees of freedom, obviously, where uh, in quantum optics and other labs, there's a, we, we have reached a, a very high level of coherent control. And so they're interesting because, and by, by these degrees of freedom will be, uh, obviously in quantum optics, that's, that will be light, you know, the electric and magnetic field. So, the, the, so, so, so um, not polarization, polarization will be discrete. So we will assume polarization constant or we'll disregard it in terms of optics. But also like, uh, as for instance, uh, trapped ions would be described by such uh, a formalism, emotional degrees of freedom, that is, um, for atoms as well. Then there's um, atomic ensemble, ensembles of pseudospins. But mostly now, I would say, a lot of optomechanics, which you've heard of yesterday from Morial, so I think you, you, you well covered there. And, uh, non, uh, and all the electromechanics that now are getting into the quantum regime, plasmonics too, some, super, some superconducting devices. So there's a lot of, of systems that abide by this formalism. So there's an interest in studying the properties of these systems in terms of quantum information, right? And uh, yeah, well, I'll be more specific in a bit. Uh, so then, um, obviously, solving quantum information problems, so you all know that the CCR algebra cannot be represented in finite dimensions. You just need to take, I don't know, for instance, in finite dimension, the trace of this will be zero, but the trace of the identity times something can never be zero, let's say. That's the first, so the first and most obvious um, incongruence that would arise. So, so the, but you all know that this is just, uh, can be represented on an L2 Hilbert space that you're familiar with. A separable Hilbert space that admits a, a discrete basis that we're going to see in a second. But, um, um, so the, the system is infinite dimensional in all quantum information problems. I'm being, I'm being very vague and generic here, but the dimension of the Hilbert space is one of the main parameters and make it more or less difficult. Solving general problems in quantum information for continuous variables would mean to solve them for all systems, yeah? Because you can embed any smaller dimensional Hilbert space into an infinite dimensional one. Uh, up to, you know, the, there could be some issues with, I don't know, indistinguishable particles from ionic systems, but up to that, it's basically all systems. And, uh, so it is difficult to solve problems very generally. So there is a description, so there is a restriction then to the Hilbert space, well, to the set of states, which is usually, well, which, is, which can be adopted, which is the Gaussian restriction. So the first thing we're going to do is introduce what Gaussian states are. And, uh, and let me comment on this 
we're going to see a lot of properties of, of such states. Why are they relevant, though, in the first place? I, I, I'm about to make it formal, but Gaussian states are nothing but the ground and thermal states, so as in uh, Gibbs thermal, thermal state of some temperature, of Hamiltonians which are bilinear in X and P, Z. Yeah, that's the most general definition. It's not the most standard definition will come to that. But these systems are therefore very common whenever uh, you can restrict your interactions, whenever it's relevant to restrict your interaction to second order. And this is very common in quantum optics because it is very difficult to let to have light interact at higher orders. It's something that one typically wants, strong nonlinearities as well. It's, a, it's been a holy grail in many senses, but um, it's a difficult thing to do for photons, which is one of the reasons why photons are so pure and, and they're so effective in, for instance, quantum communication, because right? they tend not to interact much. I'm, I'm, I'm being vague, but uh, obviously this is not the same in the solid state systems where you have photons that are very dirty, typically. And, um, So, in quantum optics, the restriction to, to, to bilinear Hamiltonians is often a very good one. And for instance, in optomechanics too, although, you know, there, there's an interest in creating an, an harmonicities. I'll come to, to the point of, of uh, like, assessing the, the sort of the value of Gaussian states as opposed to having non-Gaussian ones, eh? But, there, but, but even standard automechanics can be linearized, and it's a good uh, description. Even, even trapped ions, typically, the, given the distances between them, the Coulomb, the Coulomb potential can also be linearized, typically, and, 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 and they will give you a very good uh, approximate description of the, mo of the oscillating modes of these ions. And those systems, therefore, are all described by Gaussian states. Yeah? So there's quite a lot of interest. And to a theorist, the, the interest in working for, with Gaussian states is that they're such a nice playground where you can solve quite a lot of problems that are difficult to solve in general. And they are relevant in practice. Yeah? So there are many implementations. So there, there are a couple of caveats, obviously. One is that you shouldn't extrapolate because this is a very specific set of states that has, uh, well, certain properties that we will see, but you shouldn't make uh, claims that go beyond the Gaussian realms, typically, if you are starting with Gaussians. And uh, the second claim, which is a bit more controversial, and it's something that's been discussed quite a lot within the community, is that, is the following. And I'm going to take it, I want to discuss it at the very beginning, and then maybe later we'll come to it once more, so it'll, it'll, in order to reinforce it somehow. And it's... Um, the fact that, so a standard critique to Gaussian states is a very old one, and it goes as follows. As we will see, Gaussian states are states which have a, 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 a Gaussian Wigner function. So you're all familiar with Wigner function, and so that's probably part of the lecture that I can just skip altogether. Uh, so Gaussian states have Gaussian Wigner functions. Now the Gaussian Wigner function, and the, well, the Wigner function, so the marginal of the Wigner function, like the, you, you know, if you have one, one mode, it would be, I don't know, the integral along one direction, yeah, of the phase space. It gives you a probability of measuring quadrature uh, outcomes on the orthogonal direction. So integrate over P, you get probability over X, okay? That's a, that's a very well-known fact. It's, it's about the interpretation. It's the operational interpretation of the Wigner function, if you like. And, uh, but... So in all problems where you restrict it to quadrature measurements, which then, which means all Gaussian measurements, we won't go through Gaussian measurements formally, but they all boil down to homodyne detection, which is essentially measuring X's, P's, or combinations thereof. All problems where you restrict it to such measurements, they allow for a secret, for a, for a, for a, um, a hidden variable description naturally. It's provided by the Wigner function, which is an actual probability distribution then for Gaussian states, right? Normally, well, 
for general, Gauss, for general quantum states, the Wigner function is not a probability distribution because it can be negative. But not so for Gaussian states. So because of this model, you'll never be able to say violate, uh, well, to, to prove anything non-local. There'd be no quantum non-locality. You can never violate, you know, Bell inequalities, like with Gaussian states alone and those measurements. Now, that may be very well, which is, and that's true. And therefore, um, so people have questioned that because they can be mimicked, so ga entirely Gaussian systems can be mimicked, therefore, with classical systems, and now, therefore, they will, therefore, be useless to quantum technologies. However, there are two, well, there's a, there's a list, there's a few objections to this. One is that it's still interesting to create resor Gaussian resources, such as entanglement, and you, then you'll be able to access, and then you need some non-Gaussian key to unlock them and, and, and actually get, a, a, you know, sort of uh, harness their quantum potential, as they say. And that could be, I don't know, even measurements like uh, on-off detectors would, would be enough in principle, yeah? So, so there's still an interest in studying these systems and creating resources, such as entanglement. The second point is, and it's, the, the second point is the most fundamental one, is that although they can be mimicked, there is still the Heisenberg principle. And the Heisenberg principle limits fundamentally any quantum states, including Gaussian, obviously, as we're going to see. And, but it wouldn't be there in any classical system. Therefore, uh, say, QKD, like quantum key distribution uh, security proofs, are still fundamentally secure. Well, up to all the problems that security proofs have, but that is independent on the Gauss, of the Gaussian character, typically, right? So, 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 there's still the fun, so there's still an underlying Hilbert space, which a mimicking classical system wouldn't have. So that's the other element of interest. The third element, I would say, is related to estimation. And it's one of the reasons why, in the 80s, people went after, well, other than you know, the, stand, the, sort of the inevitable technological process, but they went after squeeze states. And you, know, you can get squeezing even with Gaussian, well, with Gaussian states, too. And the reason was, well, the first observation is, I think, or at least rumor has it, was, was that uh, Braginsky and co-workers co pointed out that in order to detect gravitational waves in this big Ligo Virgo you know, apparatus, it would be much more it'd be advantageous to uh, use squeeze light. Yeah? When you have a, a reduction of noise in one quadrature at the expense of the other because of the uncertainty principle. Then again, this claim is enough to motivate interest, huh? because you can do squeezing with Gaussian systems, which are easier to control and describe. So, and we're going to see that to, in, to, su to some extent. Um, of course, then gravitational waves were detected without squeezing a few years back. And now then they're redoing the experiments with squeeze light in um, Ligo Virgo. I can't remember how they're called, like what, which one the, the successful ones are. But. What, what experiments used that. But, um, but yeah, this, this then came to be, in a sense, eh? This. So, yes, so, want to, so how do we introduce Gaussian states? So we, let me just uh, call, uh, I'll define a quadratic Hamiltonian. This, uh, oh, by the way, the way I'm going to deliver this works that um, so the it's essentially the lectures are drawn from a book that I wrote that you can find anywhere, unless some of you are part of you know the publisher, but uh, but you can find it anywhere. Uh, but I, I mentioned in my book not because I think it's the best, and the, the, the many mostly in quantum optics that they're, they're, they're certainly better books. But like because it's mine, obviously I take in my lectures from my book because. Um, it's easier. But anyway, I'll put like still a, an abridged version of the notes, uh, well, of you know, those parts on the website, for the, of the Winter School website anyway. So everything that I say basically will be there in quite a lot of detail, maybe more detail than, than you need actually. 
I, I'm under the impression. We'll see. But um, so just in case, and I try to follow pretty much it, uh, lest I forget something. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, so this introduction of, of Gaussian states is not orthodox in a sense that um, I don't think you'll find it elsewhere in this form. But it's still the same old story. Um, so what I want to say is, so, so let me call this a quadratic Hamiltonian. And, uh, uh, um, transposed. So, let me see what I mean. Let me, let me explain what I mean. This H is a symmetric, real symmetric matrix, uh, 2n by 2n. And half is just, you see why I put half there in a second. Uh, and this R is that vector of operators. This small r is just a bunch of number, uh, like a, a two n dimensional vector, real. Okay. So that's what I call a quadratic Hamiltonian, and it's not strictly quadratic. This, this is the, the, the most general polynomial of order two in X and P. Yeah. And I can pick H quadratic uh, symmetric because. If you look at the commutation relation, you see that all anti-symmetric, all any anti-symmetric term will just give you something proportional to the identity in the end. Some operator which is proportional, so it's just just changing the, the, the zero of the energy, if you like, but it is irrelevant to any dynamical or thermodynamical as well consideration in a sense. So we don't need that. Uh, and, um, and then, uh, this is what I call H, and then Gaussian states. Is uh, is this? Is it to the minus beta H for H quadratic? Okay, and uh, you see there's. Uh, There's n squared plus n uh, um, variables within the h plus another n in the 2n, sorry, 2n in, in r, uh, sorry, parameters. I added this fake parameter beta just because I want to describe the situation where if h is finite as no limiting instances and beta goes to infinity, then I get all pure Gaussian states. Yeah? You see that this state is pure if and only if beta goes to infinity. Okay? And then you go to the ground state. That's, but, but strictly speaking, beta is would be irrelevant. I mean, I could, I, we could dispense from it. Okay? It's one additional this thing that I don't really strictly need. Uh, so these are Gaussian states. And, uh, and then the first thing one, one may want to do is, um, yes, let's say we want to find the spectrum of these states, because a lot of the properties will depend on the spectrum, and we'll see that Gaussian states have a very specific spectrum that scales in a certain way, and uh, in this infinite dimensional Hilbert space, okay? And the first thing I want to do is I want to try and, and sort of handle this bit, which will be instructive in terms of quantum optics. Maybe th if this is too basic and you're very, very well acquainted with all this stuff, like, you know, vial operators and shifts and stuff, then you, you let me know. Yell at me, and then we'll, I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll fast forward in a sense, eh? And then dwell on something else later on which might be of more interest to you. But otherwise, uh, Yes, let me, let me state it. It's easier to just state it. I will call this uh, a, uh, what did I want to say? Oh, yeah. So that's a displacement operator. 
it's easier to put, I put omega, there's a reason why, because, it, because this encodes the anti-commutation, well, the commutation relations are, can be expressed through exponential, and it's convenient to put an omega there at this stage. I'll take it, sometimes I, I, I won't use it, but, and then I just want to show that something that you, you know very well, probably, that uh, if you apply this operator dr, this is a vial or displacement or a shift operator, where you want to call it, on r, the vector, and then if I, you go d dagger, you get, of course, uh, this will get, uh, so I want uh, a dagger there, actually. <laughs> I want r minus r. Okay, and uh, so we want to prove this, that uh, minus i, rt, omega, r, and then you got r, uh, okay, so how do you prove this? Oh, yeah, that is equal to, there are many ways to do it, though, there's at least a couple I can think of to, to prove it a couple of ways to go about it, but a very quick one is that, and I'll leave it to you, is that you take the derivative of this operator with respect to R, yeah, all RJs, and show that they match. And then you can show that all derivatives match, yeah, because the second derivative will all be zero, and all the further ones. And of course, also, and you take them in zero. That's fine. It's all smooth. So there's only one solution. Even if, it's, if this is operators, there's no, 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 nothing else that can happen. So that's the way you prove it. And of course, this means that this, this, this we already knew basically, but that this shift in the, first, in the operators is just, can be accounted for, essentially, by applying a displacement operator left and right on the Hamiltonian. It doesn't matter that this is a quadratic function, okay? It's all very well behaved, so. So therefore, um, yeah, so H equals, oh, what do I want? I want D dagger there, right? The way I wrote it, yeah. Uh, so then we're down to just handling this and uh, the quadratic, the purely quadratic part, okay? And then we want to understand this part. And this we're gonna do in the following way. They start to be a bit more interesting now. We introduce what's called the symplectic group. And um, we do it that w this way. Let's say, hmm. yes. Let's say I want to describe now, instead of using the Hamiltonian to define a state through this like thermal trick, I, we just use the Hamiltonian to describe a dynamics. And we do it, we do it in Eisenberg picture. And in this regard, um, what you want to do is you want to evolve typically the canonical operator. And uh, uh, yeah. And then here I always forget a sign. That, let me pick it the same way because I keep switching this. Okay. Right. So, so let uh, uh, this canonical operator evolve. through uh, quadratic R T H R, right? Half. Yeah, so we let we want this to evolve this vector and see what happens. Okay? Because I want to understand we want to understand what the action of this quadratic polynomial purely quadratic polynomial is on the canonical operators that define the whole system in a, 
in the sense that has been already discussed. Eh? So, um, so our dot equals this. Yeah, so that's something that you we're all familiar with. So Heisenberg equation, and uh, and this is convenient. Uh, it's convenient to write this down in components for once. This is the only thing I'm going to do. This the only the only time I think. Uh, and um, so. Okay. Right. So I want to write down this this Hamiltonian explicitly. I'll have a half, which will be useful later on. And then I take all the possible commutator of commutators. So it will be RK. Rj and then plus Rj Rk Rl yes Rk Rj okay so right and then you use whatever this the symplectic form. So these are just given by I those and then I, I take into account all the factors and what you're going to get in the end is that this will be omega J L J K R K. So so geometrically, we saw that the equation wrote, it's, let, let me go back to vectors now. The equation writes that way. That's, it, that's Heisenberg equations for these operators. We drop those, and then we have to use the symmetry of H and the anti-symmetry of omega. Yeah? And you're going to get that, and that's why I put the two factors, because you, you, you get a single... So the two cancels out because you have two terms. And now, then, this can be solved in one line. It's a matrix equation. So this is a matrix equation for operators. This is op these are operators that live inside you know, matrices and vectors, OK? That's the formalism, essentially. And then uh, RT, then the solution is just uh, E omega H T. Yeah? It's an exponential equation. That will give us the evolution. Yeah, you wanted to ask? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It should. <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> I forgot this. And there too. Uh, so it's K L. Yeah, I lost one of these of these uh, labels as well. So I just wanted to make it a bit quicker because I don't want to dwell on each single line. Because otherwise, sorry. Well, well done. Was spotted. So yes. Yeah, so this is the evolution, and now comes the interesting part to us. Not quite what. Well, you know, this is interesting too. But the interesting bit is that. This evolution, so what we did is essentially through this Hamiltonian is evolving each um, component of this vector, which is still written down there thanks to this immense blackboard. We evolved each component with the same unitary evolution. Yeah? Okay? And when you do this, clearly the commutators between any of these cannot be affected, OK? They must be preserved. But this gives us a non-trivial factoid, which is the fact that 
this must still preserve the CCR. So if I put it into the CCR, and now you see why, you start to see why this formalism is so effective. Uh, so, so the CCR were, were, were satisfied at time zero, okay? So we get this non-trivial result that, let me call this uh, transpose of that. So this must still be um, well, let me write, so, so this, this formalism allows me to write this, that I can take this out of the commutator, and the commutator is still whatever it was, which is I omega. Uh, transposed, and this must still be equal to the initial commutator, which is I omega. So if you get rid of the i's, we find that this operation, well, this transformation, let's call it transformation, yeah? It's a two n, it's a two n dimensional real matrix. We'll have to preserve omega. And operations that preserve omega are called symplectic. They are actually linear canonical transformation in classical Hamiltonian uh, mechanics. So, so one is very well familiar with them, and uh, they, well, the symplectic, they form a group, obviously, and the symplectic group is one of the three classical groups, as they call them, right? so, which would be unitary, orthogonal, and symplectic. Okay? There's some, uh, so, uh, let me, I'll get rid of time, that time can be reabsorbed into H. If you look at the algebraic properties of, of a matrix to be symplectic, you'll find that it must be generated by omega times the symmetric. This you can find, you can derive independently. So this one, we call it S, and it belongs to what we call SP to NR, the real symplectic group, right? So this will clearly then play uh, a very fundamental role and we already, with these like three lines, we, we, we showed that you can sort of represent the group, at least the algebra, through, uh, on an L2 space, through a quadratic Hamiltonian. Yeah? And this, this mapping between infinite dimensional operators, like this H, and this finite dimensional uh, S, is, well, th this is really technical and I don't really know, but I learned these names by heart. So like, so this is actually a, repre a representation of the metaplectic group. You can go on Wikipedia and look up the metaplectic group. And um, which has the same algebra, but it's the same story as, you know, as SU2 and SO3. One is double covered to the other. And technically this is a projective representation of the symplectic group. That is, uh, you get, a representation times a phase factor that depends on the operation. Whatever. Basically, uh, to all extent, to, all, uh, to our purposes, there's a mapping between uh, finite dimensional, to n dimensional symplectic transformation and these operators and e to the i h acting on the Hilbert space. Yeah? That's what we're going to use. And this is one of the basic tools in this shenanigans. Um, let me just uh, see that I haven't forgotten something. All right. So then the, very, the, the first thing then you can do once you have the, okay, then, then we can solve essentially. Uh, what did I want to, oh yes, sure. So in order then to find the, the spectrum of Gaussian states, which would be interesting so that we can write them down in the Hilbert space and then you know, calculate entropies, therefore, other, and as well as other, you know, quantities which are relevant to quantum information in, in many different ways. Uh, before, we need, we need an, one, one other really basic tools, but this is, this is kind of interesting because uh, sort of, well, it's, it's, 
it's um, very well known to all of you, but maybe not in its most general form. And it's uh, essentially what you do to solve a system uh, of coupled harmonic oscillators, eh? And so you So you have all been taught that, thought that, uh, what, taught that, um, that well, when, you, when you have like, uh, you know, connected uh, springs, uh, you, can, you can solve the system by finding the normal modes, right? So breathing, Egyptian modes, I, I always like that, those, and the center of mass and that. And, um, but typically you've done that in a very simple case where um, the P's of the system, the momenta were not coupled, and often the momenta were the same, were just, uh, all the masses of those springs, they tend to be all the same, typically. Yeah? So that is sort of a simpler case. Of course, you can, in, you can uh, decompose in normal modes more general quadratic Hamiltonians, which have any coupling between X and P, as long as they are strictly positive. Oh, yeah, so something, something that I completely forgot to mention is that uh, Gaussian states are these with H greater than zero, because otherwise the operator, the operator on the Hilbert space is not even positive, and you have a, a Hamiltonian which is unbounded from below, and so you won't have a, a, any well-defined Gibbs state. Okay? So that, that I forgot. This we need for Gaussian states. We didn't need this to define states. We didn't need these arguments anywhere here. So in this story, the uh, Hamiltonian could be, so the Hamiltonian matrix could be, it, it is not necessarily positive. And in fact, that is the case for squeezing. Uh, so normal mode decomposition is just saying that given a uh, uh, certain matrix, you can always, a certain strictly positive matrix, as Stefano knows very well, uh, you, can, <laughs> you can always find, so, so given any m strictly greater than zero, there exists an S such that SMST equals D, and let me see, how did I call these in this? Oh, D, okay. Where this D is given by uh, 2 times 2 blocks, so a direct sum of 2 times 2 blocks, all proportional to a 2 times 2 identities. Yeah? And you see why this is called normal modes? Because typically, when you, when, you, when you reduce those springs in normal modes, well, there you just want to decouple them. It's slightly different. But you, you would also be able, with another canonical transformation, to bring the coefficients of x squared and p squared to the very same one. And then you get what they call the free Hamiltonian in the quantum, in, in, in QED, well, when you quantize the electromagnetic field. Eh? You have x squared plus p squared. That is the Hamiltonian. And then um, so, so, you know, nature doesn't give any squeezing for free, and, and they're always balanced, these coefficients. Um, right, so that's, um, that's this, this statement is, it's kind of interesting to see where it comes from, and it's, it's, there's a very simple proof of this, so I'm going to mention it. Um, so... What was the proof? Uh, yeah, so you can see that S equals um, square root of D. These are all, this will all be positive as we see, cause, and we know it because this is strictly positive, and congruences, when you do, when you apply uh, matrix and it's transposed on the left and it transposed on the right. So Congress transformation cannot change the, well, if S is non-degenerate, which is always the case, cannot change the signature. So all the eigenvalue, the, the, the positivity of the matrix is preserved. 
So this will all be positive. We'll have to be positive. M is positive, strictly positive by uh, hypothesis. And so I can use the square roots, and they'll still be real. And then uh, this, uh, this is an orthogonal transformation. And then I can write this down. So again, this matrix is well defined, and you see that this obviously does the job, because uh, you know this action M is uh, ah also symmetric. I forgot that. Well, when I when I write positive, I mean diagonalizable and symmetric as well. Eh? So this is symmetric, and so this will uh, give me the identity out of M acting on left left and right. The orthogonal doesn't do anything on the identity by definition. And then I, I then uh, uh, multiply by what I need to have there. So the, the square root of d squared will give me d, right? And then I want to prove that there always a, there exists a, a no such that this matrix is symplectic, OK? And it works that way. Uh, O transposed. Yeah. Uh, want to prove that there is a no such that this is the case. And then and now I'll cut it, I'll cut it short because this is slightly more technical, though very easy. So this is uh, a non-degenerate. So this matrix, because of the symmetry of M and the anti-symmetry of uh, omega, is still skew symmetric, it's still anti-symmetric. And it's also non-degenerate. And there's a little theorem that, that says that you can always uh, put, there, there, there exists a no that puts an anti-symmetric matrix in a standard form if it's non-degenerate. Well, I can't remember about the degeneracy there. But, and the standard form is essentially this one times some numbers. And then finally, D will undo these numbers. So it's, there's always a no that does this, basically. That's what I'm saying. And I want to write down all the equations here. But they're written in the notes that I'm going to put up. So, uh, so, then, uh, so then we pro we've proved that you can always s s decompose this. Any, so any strictly positive matrix can always be reduced to the normal form, which is what we refer to the, the, this sort of matrices in the rest of this lecture, in the remainder of these lectures, through a symplectic transformation. And, um, and you see that, you know that symplectic transformations are, are unitaries at the Hilbert space level. Yeah? That's what we just said. So this is very relevant to us because in the end, Everything we are going to need, everything that we, we're going to need, all the information about the spectrum of this Gaussian state, essentially this, will be contained other than beta, that, you know, but will be essentially contained in the symplectic eigenvalues of this uh, H. The symplectic eigenvalues are these, these numbers here. Yeah. There's one per mode. And the reason is that, of course, the spectrum cannot be affected by S. Okay, so we're stripping the, the, the state sort of down to its essentials and, and decomposing its form. And um, this is slightly technical, then in the notes, there's a slightly technical bit, which is a bit boring, uh, more boring than this lecture. Which is the, which is that unfortunately for some technicalities, the the, Gauss, the symplectic group is such that if you, okay, so there it's so it's not always the case that there is a not all element of S of the symplectic group that preserve omega can be written as a single as an exponential of a generator. Sometimes you need to. Who cares? I mean, it's a fact that one might, must take into account if you want to be really technical. But then I'm not going to be. I, I mentioned it, and that's it. But I don't want to get into any sort of uh, 
swamp based on that. Okay, so then, so these symplectic eigenvalues are, what are they? For a, for a Hamiltonian, they are the eigenfrequencies. Yeah, for a Hamiltonian matrix, they are, so you can always write down, there's an S that does this, essentially. Um, or maybe better, because the inverse of a symplectic is obviously a symplectic since that is a group. So I can do S, um, yeah, a sum j equal 1 to n. Okay, so any of these Hamiltonians can be written, uh, Hamiltonian matrices can be written as a symplectic acting left and right on um, a diagonal matrix with, with doubly degenerate eigenvalues, okay? And these are called the eigenfrequencies. They're the frequencies of the normal modes. For any general Hamiltonian, though, that's the non-trivial bit. And there are ways to find them which we're not going to care about, but to determine them. But... Um, um, going back to our Hamiltonian there what, that we're trying to decompose, I want to write it down as, oh, well, let me write it down the way I write it down here then. So, so uh, yeah. I want to write it down, so H equals the R dagger some S, which will, you know, which will be associated to this, this S without a hat by this metaplectic mapping that we described there. And, uh, and this RT, this very simple So, essentially, say we want to know what the entropy of a Gaussian state is. What you need to do is um, is that we just need to calculate the entropy of of this exponential. What's the policy, what's the school's policy as to breaks, do I have to break? I don't, yeah, I think it might be, uh, it might be uh, useful to everyone. Yeah, let's take it back in like five minutes maybe, yeah? Okay, five minutes then.